At the time of the February Revolution in Russia, Lenin remained in, in exile in Switzerland, where he watched events in Russia with growing alarm. The Bolshevik party at this time, one must remember, was, was still a small minority in Russia. It didn't have that much of an influence over the masses. It had some influence, of course, because of its uh, past uh, heritage and, and traditions. But the main problem in Petrograd, uh, frankly, was the leadership. Uh, all of the, the main leaders were, were outside of uh, Petrograd at the time of the revolution and only gradually returned. Uh, the first to return from Siberia were Kamenev and, and Stalin, who immediately took up a, a, what you could say, an opportunist position or a conciliatory position in relation to the events that were taking place. Let us recall that the February Revolution was carried through by the workers and the soldiers, as I say, the peasants in uniform, who immediately set up these marvellous revolutionary organs, representative organs, the Soviets. The real power, everybody knew this, the real power, even from February onwards, was in fact in the hands of the Soviets. And yet, and yet, the Soviet leaders, mainly consisting of what we would call reformist leaders, the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, in effect handed the power back to the bourgeoisie in the form of the provisional government. Uh, this situation was aptly described by Lenin at the time as, as a, a situation of dual power. There were two centers of power. Yes, but the real power, in fact, was in the hands of the Soviet. Now, at the time, there was enormous pressure from the reformists, even from the masses themselves, for unity. This idea that you must unite all the, the so-called progressive forces behind the provisional government, that was the idea. And this uh, idea was, was swallowed, hook, line and sinker, in particular by Kamenev and Stalin. Now there is quite a remarkable book which I've got here by a man called uh, Nikolai Suhanov, that was his party name uh, in any case. Suhanov was a left Menshevik, close to Martov, a supporter of the Zimmerwald uh, position, if you like, uh, who nevertheless was a member of the Executive Committee of the Soviets and therefore a very important eyewitness and quite a sharp observer of events. In this book he describes quite uh, remarkably, with remarkable accuracy, he describes Kamenev as, if you like, a born conciliator, a man, a very intelligent man, it's true, but nevertheless someone that was inclined to a certain softness, uh, that avoided conflict, avoided the, the difficulties, but capitulated the first pressure. And also Stalin, these two, of course, took over the leadership of the Bolshevik party and steered it in, in the direction, not only of supporting the provisional government under the guise of unity, but even actively supported and proposed the unification of the Bolshevik party with the Mensheviks, if you can imagine such a thing. It's quite amusing, I think, to quote what Sukhanov has got to say about uh, Stalin, if I can find that quote. I assume we are. And he refers to the uh, absence of leadership. The Bolshevik party, he says, in spite of the low level of its officer corps, that's the leadership, had a whole series of most uh, uh, massive figures and able leaders among the generals. And here he refers to Stalin. Stalin, however, during his modest activity in the executive committee, that's the Soviet executive committee, produced, and not only on me, the impression of a grey blur looming up now and then dimly and not leaving any trace. There is really nothing more to be said about him. This is uh, Suhanov's observation in relation to Stalin. 
the real situation, which you can expect in any revolution actually, is that the revolutionary leadership comes under colossal pressure. All kinds of pressure, particularly if like the pressure of so-called public opinion. In the Federal Revolution, as I've said in, on an earlier occasion, it was like a great big street party in which everyone is cheering, everyone is happy, uh, everyone is, thinks that the, the victory has been won, we have won, we have won, and everyone is in favour, of course, of unity, the maximum unity. And therefore, the ability to stand against that pressure for unity, you know this argument, it's often put forward today, by the reformists in general, I would say the left reformists uh, in particular, that we must unite, we mustn't have disunion, we mustn't have splits. Lenin, on the other hand, throughout his whole life was never afraid of, uh, of disunity, if you like, of fighting for a principled position, even at the cost of parting company with people. Uh, Lenin wasn't afraid of splits, where splits were necessary. And therefore, when he discovered that the fact that Stalin and Kamenev were actually proposing, on the basis of unity, to reunify with the Mensheviks, he was absolutely horrified. Uh, in his Swiss exile, uh, he was like, if you like, he was like a caged tiger, champing at the bit, frustrated, impatient. And he bombarded the Bolshevik party in Russia with a series of letters and telegrams which sharply disagreed with the line that had been taken by the, uh, the comrades on the spot, if you like. He demanded n no support for the provisional government, distrust Kerensky in particular, he said. Kerensky, of course, was, uh, was on the left of the provisional government. He was originally the only person that was a member both of the Soviet Executive Committee and the provisional government. He was supposed to be a left. A very popular man, by the way, at this particular stage. And yet Lenin uh, sharply warned the leaders, don't, don't trust this man, don't trust the, the liberals in general, and don't trust this man, the so-called left Kerensky, in particular, and no growing close to other parties, no question of unification. He, he put forward, the arming of the workers is the only solution, uh, land to the peasants, factory to the workers, all power to the Soviets. That was Lenin's position right from the word uh, go. Now, of course, the difficulty that Lenin faces was very simple. How to get back to Russia as quickly as possible? You'd have thought that that was fairly easy. The distance from Switzerland to, to, to uh, Petrograd was not that um, far by train, but there was a problem. Uh, how to get there? Through Germany? When, when you're in the middle of a war here. Lenin attempted, first of all, through his agents and through his supporters, to get permission for the Allies, the French and British, to, to, to cross their territory. They refused, of course, point blank. Understanding that the presence of Lenin in Russia, of course, would, would uh, stimulate the revolution, would carry it forward, which is the last thing that these gentlemen, of course, would have liked. And therefore, at the end of the day, and reluctantly, Lenin was compelled to take the only course of action practically open to him, and that's to say, to open negotiations with the German authorities and ask permission to return to Russia via Germany. And finally, this was agreed. The German imperialists, of course, were not uh, too unhappy about this. <laughs> they precisely were interested, since they were at war with Russia, they were interested in knocking Russia out of the war by one means or another. Now, of course, a lot of nonsense is, is talked, quite malicious uh, nonsense is talked today, about Lenin uh, apparently being a German agent, receiving money from Germany and German gold and so on. Complete nonsense, absolute fabrication which was uh, comprehensively demolished at the time, incidentally. But of course, Lenin really had no choice but to accept terms, or to reach terms with the German uh, militarists, the like German imperialists, to travel uh, through Germany to get to Russia. He made, he made stringent conditions, by the way, that the, there should be a so-called sealed train, that's to say a train which wouldn't stop, which wouldn't uh, allow anyone to get on or off during the transit through Germany to avoid any suspicion of any contact whatsoever with the German authorities. And on that basis, he eventually did succeed on the 16th of April in making this historic journey from, from, from Switzerland through Germany, finally through Finland to 
revolutionary Petrograd. I might add, incidentally, that he wasn't the only one that did this. Martov and the Mensheviks also had to, had no alternative but to, to resort to the same procedure, and yet nobody, to my knowledge, has ever suggested any of them were German agents. So this is just a complete uh, monstrous fabrication. So here we have the situation, 16th of April, 1917, Lenin's train finally draws up at the Finland station in Petrograd. And the train is met by a mass demonstration with banners and flags and cheering workers and soldiers and a brass band. And the Soviet leaders also sent a delegation, rather reluctantly I might add, because they, they knew what they, were, what they could ex ex expect. Lenin was presented, of course, with a marvellous bouquet of flowers. Uh, one, one imagines it, it must have been quite a, uh, an incredible sight to see the leader of the world revolution, this uh, small statured, uh, bald man, revolutionary, to the court, standing there with a bunch of flowers in it. He probably didn't know what to do with them. But what he did was quite significant. When the Soviet leaders attempted to come and meet him to uh, shake his hand and so on, he turned his backs on them. He turned his back on them and turned towards the workers and peasants uh, uh, present and launched into a tirade, a revolutionary tirade, demanding no confidence in the provisional government and that the only power in Russia that could be accepted is the power of the workers and peasants expressed through the, through the Soviets. Now what was the response of this speech, this electrifying speech by, by Lenin at the Finland station? Well. Quite simply, most of the of the leaders, at least, the workers and soldiers, were obviously very pleased. But the reaction of the leaders, including the Bolshevik leaders, was not pleased at all. One of the Soviet leaders present uh, described it, quote unquote, as the ravings of a madman. And don't you believe that Kamenev and, and the others uh, thought any differently? They were shocked, visibly shocked, because this went entirely contrary to the line that they've been putting. Yes, it's not generally realized, in fact, that Lenin's uh, letters that were sent insistently, insistently from Switzerland, which are now known as the April Theses, were not actually published by Pravda. Or they were published with considerable delay and they were cut, they were censored to suit the, uh, the purposes of Stalin and, and Kamenev. And here there begins a, 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 an episode which is absolutely vital for the success of the October Revolution. Lenin, in effect, had to launch a, quite a sharp internal battle inside the Bolshevik party in order to redirect and rearm the party on the lines of, of preparing for a new revolution under the slogan, the well-known slogan, all power to the Soviets. Incidentally, on this question of that slogan, that's quite an interesting point. Of course, everybody knows this slogan, do they not? All power to the Soviets. Yes, but what does it mean? The Soviets at that time, let's not uh, forget this, were entirely under the control, not of the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks were a small minority. They were under the control of the reformists and the left reformists, the, or the right reformists, even, people like uh, Seretelli, Dan, Lieber in particular. There were some left, Sukhanov was a left, Martov was a left, men, left Mensheviks if you like. But broadly speaking, it was under the control of people who did not believe that the working class should take power. People that were convinced to the marrow of their bones, like all the reformers today, every single one of them, oh yes, including the most left leaders, they're all convinced, none of them talk about socialism anymore, you notice that, they're all convinced at the bottom of their hearts that power must not be in the hands of the working class. They don't believe the working class is capable of running society. That's a simple fact of the matter. They have no, no faith in the working class. Power must be in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Even Suhanov, the left, had this position. You read his memoirs, you, you can see that nobody believed. After all, this was supposed to be a bourgeois democratic revolution, was it not? It was only Trotsky prior to 1917 that, uh, that put forth even the possibility that the Russian workers could come to power before the workers of Western Europe, of Germany, for example. And here was Lenin, as soon as he comes back to Russia, putting forward what? Putting forward Trotskyism, 
or even anarchism. He was accused of putting forth anarchism uh, uh, at the time. No, this position of Lenin completely shocked the Bolshevik party. The leaders came out against this. It was an obvious Kamenev, Stalin came out against the, uh, this, uh, th this position. And therefore there was a sharp battle which was settled in a conference, a famous historic conference called the April Conference, where Lenin actually appealed to the workers, the Bolshevik workers, in the factories and the soldiers over the heads of the Central Committee. Oh yes, this Bolshevik, this is support of democratic centralism, he pointed out, we mustn't forget this, he pointed out that the working class, the masses, are always more revolutionary than the most revolutionary party. And here you have the facts of the matter. Lenin appealed to the workers over the heads of the Bolshevik Central Committee and he succeeded. He succeeded in winning a majority, changing the line of the party, changing the line of Pravda, and therefore preparing the Bolshevik party to, to the task of what? Not the task of taking power. This was out of the question. The Bolshevik party was a small minority. Of course, we all know now, it's told to us every single day, this terrible, this stupid lie about uh, the October Revolution being a coup led by a tiny minority, which of course is an arrant piece of arrant stupidity. How can a tiny minority lead a revolution in a country of 150 million people, I ask myself. Oh no, Lenin's position was not that at all. Lenin's position, as he put it forward in the slogan, patiently explain. Patiently explain, put forward transitional demands which the masses could understand, which were what? Peace, bread and land, incidentally. Peace, bread and land. There's not a single socialist uh, slogan present here. Peace, bread and land theoretically could be established under capitalism. Oh no. But on, on the basis of this government, this provisional government, it could not be the case. It could not be the case. This was a government of, of landlords, bankers and capitalists completely tied on the one hand to big feudal landed, landed property, therefore no question of giving land to the peasants, which is a major demand. Secondly, a government that was completely in tow to the imperialists of the Entente. And this was rapidly revealed. Three days after Lenin returned, one of the major leaders of the provisional government, the leader of the cadet party, Milyukov published a note which completely reversed everything that the Soviet had agreed in relation to a peace uh, without uh, annexations or indemnities, a democratic peace, that was the line put forward by the reformists. And here Milyukov publishes a note in which he specifically states that Russia will remain in the war, Russia will be faithful to its imperialist allies, Russia will meet all its wartime obliga obligations, and furthermore, Russia's wartime aims, uh, aggressive aims of Tsarism, would be maintained. In other words, a note which expresses that there's no change, none whatsoever, between the, the war aims of this government and that of Tsarism. Of course, this note of Milyukov immediately provoked a massive reaction. Workers, many of them armed, soldiers and others came onto the streets in mass demonstrations to protest against this uh, note which appeared in the press. And a colossal uh, mass movement developed which forced Milyukov and Gutskov, the main uh, bourgeois elements in, in the coalition, to resign. They provoked a crisis, ultimately preparing the way for the entry of the reformists of the uh, Mensheviks and SS as, as members of a coalition government with the bourgeoisie. Now, before I finish this part of uh, the discussion, I'd just like to dwell on this same question which I've raised of the content, the real content of all power to the Soviets. What Lenin was saying basically was this to the workers and peasants in the Soviets. He said something approximately like, look, we believe that only a socialist revolution can solve your problems. We believe that only a socialist revolution in Russia can grant peace, bread and land. But okay, you don't agree with us, you think that we're too advanced, you think that we're too extreme, that's fine, that's okay. We accept that we're a minority. But look, why doesn't uh, Tsertelli and Dan and Martov take power? Let the Soviet uh, reformist leaders take power and we will guarantee them, Lenin said this on many occasions, we will guarantee them that the whole question of, of the revolution in Russia will be settled 
by a democratic, peaceful debate inside the Soviets. That's what Lenin offered. Far from the idea of a coup and a conspiracy and a bloodthirsty monster that was looking for to provoke civil war. On the opposite, Lenin, on the contrary, Lenin said many times, civil war is not necessary. Bloodshed is not necessary. You, the, the leaders of the working class, you can take power peacefully and we will support this and we will grant, uh, we will reduce the whole question to a peaceful debate within the Soviets. In other words, Lenin was saying to the reformist leaders, you take power. Of course, uh, Lenin knew perfectly well that these reformist leaders were not prepared to take power. And because they were not prepared to take power, because they refused to take power, because they handed power back to the landlords and bankers and capitalists, that prepared the way, of course, to a bloody settling of, of accounts, as we will see in future discussions of this fundamental important question, which is the Russian Revolution of 1917.